Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, so it's been a couple of weeks. Um, I've just been really sick, that's all. Um, I'm still not 100%, so I might be pausing the video to sneak off and cough and splutter to myself for a, um, intermittently. You won't see that, of course. But um, yeah, we'll see how we go today. I think it's going to be a little bit of a shorter video anyway. We're just trying to wrap up this chapter, this first chapter, Reflection and Interrogation, and the second, um, or the, the second part of the sub-chapter, The Perceptual Faith and Reflection. Uh, so the first part of the video is The Real and the Imaginary. So Merleau-Ponty says that these two things, the real and the imaginary, are two different orders or theatres, which are set up within us before the act of discrimination. So that's really the key point there. They're different ways of viewing. They're different ways of understanding the world. They're different, completely different phenomena um, prior to any kind of active cognitive act, an act of discrimination. So in other words, we don't perceive first and then decide oh, this percept is real or it's imaginary based on its coherence. Rather, the real is, is coherent and probable because it's real, not the other way around. Um, and the imaginary like uh, delusions or hallucinations. The imaginary is incoherent and improbable because it's imaginary, not the other way around. So we are, um, th the idea here is that we, we don't approach the world judging everything. We don't have this, we don't bring this kind of intellectual activity to our understanding, to our, to, our, to our lives, to our existences. We don't bring that to our perception. We, we, we live in the real and it's, it's, it's probable and it's uh, coherent because it's real, because it is that background, that perceptual faith. It is the world we live in. So the, the, the really, the, and this, this does sound strange, I think, because we do think straight away, well, how would you know if something's real or, or an illusion? You'd have to weigh it, you'd have to measure it up, you'd have to, to weigh it against some kind of benchmark and decide then. And after you've made that decision, then we decide it's real or imaginary. But that, that goes against what Malo Ponte is saying, because He's saying we live in, in order to, to make that kind of decision, you already are in the world of the real. You're already there um, and you've already decided what's real. And you've decided that not, not through a deliberate intellectual act, but you've decided it through existing in it. The fact that you are in the world already the fact that you're able to make that kind of discrimination, that second order discrimination, tells you that you've already decided, if you like, on the real. And that's that's really the point. It's, it's a rejection of this intellectual approach to human experience, this overly um, analytical approach way that we think about ourselves as, as always everything that comes down to, to to thought and to cognition and to the intellect um, but but that's exactly what Milo Ponte is questioning here that's not how we live that's not what human experience is that's not how things are for us um, life is not a constant cognitive activity the fact that we can make intellectual judgments can only, is only possible because we're already in the world 
in the real. And so that's that, and that's what Malo Ponte is interested in, that, that deeper reality. And that has already been decided, decided, not intellectually, not cognitively, not actively, but it's already been decided. And, and this is, this is what's reflected in the perceptual faith. We're, we're already in the world of the real. We don't have to decide. We don't approach reality judging everything and deciding, okay, that's real. That's real. That's real. Um, it, it's not, that's not how we live. We live in the real. Any kind of, um, so that any perception is real, not because we judge, not because we um, determine that it's real and coherent, but it's it's immediately real. It immediately belongs to this world as part of this perceptual faith. And um, the imaginary, delusions, hallucinations, these immediately don't belong. It's not that they're incoherent. It's not that we, we see something and then see if it's coherent. See and realize that it isn't, and then and then accord it the status of illusion. <clears throat> it's already illusory, <clears throat> um, and to that end, Malo Ponte says, truly imaginary f- phenomena from the very first never properly fit into the world. The least particle of the perceived incorporates it from the first into the perceived. The most credible phantasm glances off at the surface of the world. It is this presence of the whole world in one reflection, its irremediable absence in the richest and most systematic deliriums that we have to understand. So the perceived thing is immediately perceived, perceived, i.e. real. It immediately testifies to the presence of the whole world. It fits in as a, a part of this whole world and the whole world is appears through this thing through this perception and that and again that it's it's immediately grasped in this way this is that perceptual faith that it's prior to any intellectual um, analytical cognitive act that we might subsequently perform this perceptual faith is is necessary. The fact that we live, the fact that we are in a real world is necessary in order to then deliberate about it. And the same with the, the imaginary from the other perspective. The, the imaginary testifies from the very first to the absence of, of a world. It, it just, it doesn't fit. Not not because we've weighed it up, weighed up an individual perception and decided that this doesn't belong, but from the very first, we recognize it as not a part of this, not a part of the real. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this. Maybe there is maybe a potential objection here with something like schizophrenia, for example, where um, perhaps there is a complete break where um, one the, the patient actually does lose the ability to distinguish between the real and the illusory, the imaginary. But I think we have to be careful about bringing in an example like that because that, that's not a case of... Um, being actually that that's not a, that's not in, it's not uh, investigating what Milo Ponty wants to investigate, which is is being through phenomenology through experience, because that is a case where that process is no longer functioning. It's no longer working the way it should. So it's it's like a. Um, yeah, it, instead of functioning, it's a malfunctioning, and so it, it it really doesn't make sense to to object to what Malo Ponti is saying here, 
that we that we immediately grasp the real and the imaginary um, because of of something like schizophrenia. Yeah, we know that this any process, any any theory can um, be violated by the wheels falling off the wagon, right? Anything can cannot work properly. But when it is working properly in, in a normal um, human life, then the, these two things, the real and the imaginary, are um, immediately grasped as what they are. Milo Ponti says... Uh, You'll never convince someone who is experiencing a hallucination or, or there's no point in trying to convince them that their hallucination isn't real. They know it's not real, but that doesn't stop the fact that they're experiencing it. But they're not, they're not confused about whether it's real or not, that they're aware that this is a hallucination and, um, so, so, there's no question about that. The problem is what to do about it, the fact that they're experiencing it. Um, and I mentioned this in the Phenomenology of Perception series. Well, it's just such a great example. I'm not sure if I've mentioned it. I don't think I've mentioned it yet here. But he talks about a woman who um, would imagine, would, she, she thought there was like um, white powder in her bed when she went to get into it at night. So this, this is someone living in a, or she was in a um, psychiatric hospital or something, uh, and even though there was nothing there. Um, and then one, one night, the doctors actually did sprinkle some white powder in her bed. And when she, when she pulled back the covers to get in, she was genuinely surprised to see there's really white powder there, even though that that's what she's been hallucinating every night so there is a difference and even even the person experiencing the the hallucination recognizes the difference but the problem that doesn't that doesn't fix the problem it doesn't doesn't alleviate the fact that they're experiencing this hallucination but the problem is not that they're confused maybe about the real and so then Milo Ponti goes on to say even though we do know from the, from the outset whether something's real or imaginary, this isn't to say that we can never be deceived. And here he talks about this really interesting concept of the fragility of the real. Uh, so imagine you are walking on the beach and you see a piece of wood. You think it's a piece of wood, but as you get closer, it turns out to be a rock. So the illusion of the wood dis dissipates and a new appearance takes its place. In this case, we tend to believe that the new appearance could just as easily be false. Right? The, uh, the, 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 I see a rock, but I, I thought I saw a piece of wood before, and I was wrong about that. So the, I, the fact that I'm seeing a rock now could also be wrong, could all just as easily be false. So instead of real, instead of according this perception, um, the, the index of real, the skeptic wants to call it merely probable. And we can never actually ascertain what is real. However, this is what Milo Ponti says, the fact remains that at the moment I speak, it incontestably gives itself as real and not as very possible or probable. And if subsequently it breaks up in its turn, it will do so only under the pressure of a new reality. What I can conclude from these disillusions or deceptions, therefore, is that perhaps reality does not belong definitively to any particular perception, that in this sense it lies always further on. But this does not authorize me to break or to ignore the bond that joins them one after the other to the real. Now, this is a really nice quote, I think, and really clarifies some, some things. So, um, Milo Ponti says the, 
the moment I speak of the moment I speak, it gives itself as real. The point here is not that it's real. It's real for me at the at the moment. This is a, a mistake. This leads to some kind of relativism, um, where you know everybody's has their own realities or whatever. So that that's not what Malo Pond is getting at. It's not that it's it's real for you or anything like that. Rather, reality is not in any one perception. It's always further on, but connected to, or perhaps better, made up of a chain of perceptions. So each perception is real, not for you or for me, but in the way it was perceived. Each perception is real in the way it was perceived. In other words, from this distance, in this lighting, with this um, optical apparatus, perhaps my vision's not very good, whatever. But, but under these conditions, this is how the world, the real world, reveals itself. This is how the real world appears. And that that is real. It, it's just as real as anything else. The fact that you're not seeing unvarnished reality, a, a, a real hidden underneath all of these illusory perceptions, that's a myth that Ponti talks about. That, that's the myth that Ponti wants to dismiss. And this is just a consequence of thinking of changing the way you're thinking about what a human being is. We're not a a detached subject looking at a world which is separate from us. We are thoroughly immersed within the world and we are a perspective upon the world. And that, that perspective is a part of the world, the reality of the world, because there's nothing else. There is no hidden, genuine truth, capital T truth, capital B being underneath all of these perceptions. The perceptions are a part of the real. And that's what Ponti means when he says um, reality doesn't belong to any individual perception. It's always, if you like, further on. It's all, every perception is subject to revision. But there is this bond connecting them. And, and, and they are all real. Because there's nothing else for them to be. They're not, they're not, they're not false. They are just the way the world appears under that, from that particular perspective. And that's the only way the world can appear from a particular perspective. And so this is what I mean when it's like you have to reorient yourself because we're not a a separate subject. We are immersed within the world. Um, And so... The way that we view, the way that we perceive, has to be a part of the real. Because there is nothing else. And Ponti goes on to say that, um, with another quote, this one's kind of long, each perception is mutable and only probable. It is, if one likes, only an opinion. But what is not opinion, what each perception, even if false, verifies, is the belongingness of each experience to the same world, their equal power to manifest it as possibilities of the same world. If the one takes the place of the other so well, to the point that one no longer finds any trace of it a moment after the illusion, it is precisely because they are not successive hypotheses about an unknowable being, but perspectives upon the same familiar being. And this is why the very fragility of a perception, attested by its breakup 
and by the substitution of another perception, far from authorizing us to efface the index of reality from them all, obliges us to concede it to all of them, to recognize all of them to be variants of the same world, and finally to consider them not as all false, but as all true, not as repeated failures in the determination of the world, but as progressive approximations. Brilliant. So each perception on its own can't be more than opinion, if you like, Malopondi says. But what is not opinion is that each perception belongs to the same world, the same reality, manifesting the world as a possibility of that world. And that's as real as anything. That's that, like I said before, that is what the real is because we are immersed in the world, because the world only appears to a perspective, a finite perspective that is immersed in the world. It doesn't appear to a detached subject because such a thing is not, it's, it's either um, a fantasy or at the very least, it's not what human life is about. It's not what human existence is. And that, that's what we're interested in here. We're not interested in trying to theorize um, some kind of, you know, extra spatial, extra temporal, godlike view of reality. Um, we're trying to understand reality from the only perspective we have of it, which is our own. And that's a finite one that is, that is immersed, entangled within within the world. So indeed, it's the fact that one perception takes the place of the prior one so completely that we don't even, once the illusion's been dispelled, once the um, I get closer and see that it's a rock, not a piece of wood, at that point I can't even see how it could have been a piece of wood. Now all I see is, is the rock. The fact that that can happen, that, that one perception takes the place of, of a prior one so completely, is evidence that they aren't successive hypotheses about an unknowable being hidden underneath all of these um, perceptions, but rather they are all perspectives upon the same familiar being. That they are perspectives on the, the, that world, that being, as the way that it is possible, the way that it can possibly appear to a finite, engaged, immersed perspective. So rather than removing the index of reality from them all, which is what the skeptic advocates, Ponti says we must attribute it to all of them as variants of the same world. They are progressive approximations to a final truth, if you like, capital T, that doesn't actually exist. That, that is, is, um, that's what's illusory. The idea that there is this final truth where, okay, now you know what the real is instead of just just a perspective on it because it's the real is always the real from a perspective it's always it's always how it appears and that's the phenomenology in Milo Ponti you can't get outside that it starts with experience it starts with that engaged perspective Okay, so let's have a look at the second part of the video, Rejection of Reflection. So Ponti, just in, in, by way of kind of wrapping up this, this chapter, um, he gives three reasons. He doesn't, he, I don't think he outlines them the, the way that I am here. This is just my summary of it. He gives three reasons anyway why reflection um, doesn't work here. First, he says, it transforms the world into a noema. 
So that, that word noema, that's a Husserlian term, and it just means the perceived as such, the, the way the perceived is consciously known, is consciously grasped, the way that it appears to a subject. So it's something, and this, this, this is going a bit more into Husserl's philosophy, but it's something which is constituted by a subject. So it has nothing to do with any kind of um, imagined or supposed external reality. It, the noema is completely within the within the subject, constituted by the subject. So it's it's this the an individual person's own um, object, and according to Husserl's epoche, <clears throat> we've bracketed out the entirety of the of the external natural world. <clears throat> so what the world is like is irrelevant to Husserl with, with the noema. The noema is something <clears throat> internal to the to the subject. The second reason, so that's the first reason Milo Ponti um, rejects reflection. The second reason is it distorts the being of the reflecting subject by reducing it to a thought. Um, in Husserl's case, it's like it reduces it to a transcendental ego, some kind of detached, isolated um, subject. And Husserl says this at some point, somewhere in ideas, he says something like, um, it doesn't even matter if the, the rest of the world could disappear. There could still be experience for the individual because we've already bracketed the external world. The external world has nothing to do with the, uh, the constitution of, of noema by a subject. But what it does... What reflection does more generally for Malo-Ponti is it turns the, the subject into a thinking agent, into a, a cog, cog, cognizing agent. So it, plays, it gives priority to intellection, to cognitive activity. And that is always going to be secondary for Malo-Ponti. That, that's something which comes after we are already engaged in the world after we find ourselves in a world with other things, with other people. And that, that's the world that Milo Ponti is interested in, not this um, in essence, it's a secondary act, but what reflection does is it, it takes that secondary act and sees it as the main one. So it as Milo Ponti says, it distorts the being of the subject into a thinking agent, first and foremost. Whereas there's this deeper level that Milo Ponti wants to understand, which is which goes back to that perceptual faith. The world that we we live in is not a world that we um, deduce, or not a world that we cognize. It's a world that we experience before all of that, before that kind of intellectual activity. And the third reason is that it renders unthinkable relations with other subjects in a world common to them. So if, if this is the case, reflection is, is, is true. You have this reflecting, thinking subject that constitutes a noema, an object which is which has nothing to do with any kind of external reality, um, then th there's just no way to bridge the gap then to see how we can be part of um, a world common, with a world that we share in common with other people. So, reflection establishes basically a dualism that consists in the mind, which is that which thinks, 
and the world, which is that, which is what is thought. So there's no longer any um, connection between the two, or rather the connection is now something that the thinking subject wholly takes on him or herself. So there's no... <clears throat> It, it, like, like we said before, it just can, it doesn't get outside the thinking agent. Everything is is turned inwards, um, and that is is basically the exact opposite of what Malay Ponte is interested in, and the exact opposite of how he sees reality in the world. And and the and I totally agree with that. Further, it makes no sense to talk about a common world that we inhabit with others because your world has become an ideality. Like earlier, we talked about the number seven or a triangle. It, it has that kind of sense. Rather than being something we are immersed in as a perspective, it, it now acquires this kind of abstract, idealized quality and that is something that we can't inhabit and we can't inhabit it especially with other people so for those three reasons by way of summary Ponti rejects reflection and there's one further problem that he notes which haunts reflection he says from its inaugural act the double game he calls it the double game so reflective analysis starts from a situation that pre-existed the reflective act. And that's that's the double game here. We called this earlier, this pre-existent um, situation, the pre-constituted world. And it's a double game because reflection requires it, even as it excludes it. I was able to appeal from the world and the others to myself and take the route of reflection only because first I was outside of myself, in the world, among the others, and constantly this experience feeds my reflection. So in order for reflection to take place, it assumes a pre-reflected reality we were first a part of. You can't engage in reflection if you you don't already exist in a world in the real and because this this is prior to reflection to cognition to intellection that's why Milo Ponti calls it faith perceptual faith uh, and also of interest in that quote although we don't Milo Ponti doesn't drill into it here is this way he says I was outside myself in the world among the others I was outside of myself and that is a nice way of of describing what I was saying earlier we are not detached spectators locked within ourselves viewing something outside of ourselves we are just perspectives perspectives within this world and th therefore we are not locked within ourselves looking at something around us we are quite quite seriously outside ourselves we are in the world not as a locked in self-contained nucleus but we're in the world as as a perspective, and I think that's the best way to think of this. Human beings aren't little minds separate from, from everything else. We are perspectives. We are the, the opening of a perspective. And that, I think, if you, can, if you can get your head around that, things start falling into place. And that's what Milo Ponti means when he says, I'm outside myself in the world and among others. I am not an enclosed entity. I am a perspective opening out upon this world that, that, that I, I emerge within.
I arise within. All right, let's have a look at a summary. So first up, the real and the imaginary. These are, Meloponte says, two different orders or theatres which are prior to an act of discrimination. We don't first perceive and then decide the percept is real or imaginary based on its coherence. The real is coherent and probable because it is real. The imaginary is incoherent and improbable because it's imaginary. So there's no intervening cognitive step here. We're not constantly judging reality to determine if if this part of it is real or that part of it is false. This this happens before like this um our, our our knowledge of this of the real and the imaginary takes place before we intellectualize, before we um, cognitively try to determine anything. And in fact, it's only possible for us to cognitively determine anything if we already exist in the real, if we already know where we are. And then we talked about the fragility of the real. And this is a really nice concept. I like this one. Um, so reality is not in any one perception. Rather, each perception is a real possibility of the world. Each perception can break down and be replaced by a different perception. But this doesn't mean that, so in that sense, each perception is fragile. But that doesn't mean that each perception must be merely probable or illusory. Rather, it means that they're all real. They're all real as perspectives upon reality as the way that the world reveals itself to us as a possibility. Um, the second part of the video, rejection of reflection. So the three reasons Ponti doesn't like reflection. First, it transforms the world into a noema. This is very inward. It's very... Um, constituting subject takes over and and creates this this object it's very Husserlian with the epoche we've broken we've detached ourselves from any from um, assuming anything about an external reality the exact opposite of the direction that Meloponti wants to go secondly it distorts the being of the reflecting subject by reducing it to thought turns the agent turns the thinker sorry it turns the subject into a thinker rather than an existing subject and it is the existing subject first third it renders unthinkable relations with other subjects in a world common to them um, so it's it's yeah there's no way to then bridge this gap if we've if we've bracketed out the external We've bracketed out other people as well, and they become nothing more than noema that we constitute for ourselves. Instead of instead of reaching and apprehending other people, we 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 create our own object. They appear for us in a certain way. And, and this way is divorced from any kind of uh, external truth. Um, and finally, we had the double game that Ponty talked about, the way that reflection requires this pre-constituted world, but at the same time, it, it excludes it. It ignores it in order to follow this this path of reflection, to take, as Malabondi says, the root of reflection. Okay, and so that's us for today. Um, I should have learnt 
not to say a video is going to be short at the beginning. I've done that before, been bitten, and um, but I was sure this was going to be. I'm not I don't, actually. I don't know how long it is, but yeah, what, whatever, whatever the length is is fine. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped, and I'll catch you next time.